Hi, my name is Fonda Davis, and this is August 15th, 2015. And um, I'm here to tell my story, and I'm happy to do it because I used to think I would never get a chance to tell my story. I thought I would die with my story. So um, my story starts when I was 13, and I met my high school sweetheart. Um, I was um, so thrilled that actually somebody took an interest in me and, um, because my dad had never taken an interest in me and, and I never felt valuable. So when this young man came along and paid attention to me, I, you know, I, I was caught. Um, and we dated for five years and I got married when I was 18 and he was 20 and um, started off three months into the marriage. I was pregnant with the first child. and. Um, and they came every 18 months or two years after that for the first six years. Um, so I was home with four babies and, um, and early on in the marriage something didn't seem right um, with my relationship because um, my husband was gone all the time, all the time. Um, and just very distant and I, I didn't understand it. Um, I, I thought, you know, marriage was your home every night having dinner and the kids and um, and I would, um, I was very lonely and I asked him where he was going and he said it was always work, always work, he had to work, he had to meet people and um, I remember just becoming very despondent and hopeless and um, and a lot of lonely nights and crying but I didn't tell anyone because um, well, I was a people pleaser. I didn't want anyone to think bad about my husband. I didn't tell my family, you know, you just you just keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. But we were drifting further and further apart. And about six years into the marriage, we had reached like a crisis point where um, I just knew something was going on. And I remember asking him one time, have you been unfaithful to me? Um, I just pinned him down and he said, well, yes, once or twice, but it was only with prostitutes. And I remember the big relief, oh, it's only with prostitutes. That's, that's a good thing because I, I grew up in a home where pornography was um, just something men do. And it was just the accepted thing. We, we dropped my dad off at the X-rated movie theater when we would go school clothes shopping. And he always had... Um, pornographic magazines laying around, so I thought, well, that's that's what men do. I don't like it, but if, at least he's not having an affair, and, you know, maybe, maybe I can fix this. Um, and shortly after that, um, a friend invited us to a marriage encounter weekend, and um, it was wonderful because he, he came truthful for what I thought was truthful for the first time, and he confessed to being in several relationships, and he um, he was crying, he was sad, he was remorseful, and um, I just felt like, wow, this is it. We're getting our new start. Um, I felt like uh, I I had to forgive. You know, when I, when I first was at the retreat and I saw these other women crying, and I thought, oh, that's terrible. They have a sad story. And then God said, what about you? What will you do if you find something out? And and I thought, well, that's I can't live with that. And and um, but then I was reminded that Christ died on the cross for my sins, so I didn't have any choice. I have to forgive him. So I went back with open arms, and I forgave him, and I said, I don't even want to know any details. We're just, let's just move on. We have a new life and a new start now. We did the, um, you know, we renewed our wedding vows, and um, he was on fire for the Lord, and, and I thought, oh, this is it. We, this, is, this is my ministry. It's going to be to tell all people that every marriage can be saved if Jesus is in the middle of it. And so I was very excited. Um, and he was refreshed to um, be out from underneath the burden of his secrets. And, um, and we moved on, and it seemed like a good honeymoon period for a few years. Um, and then, then all of a sudden, I felt the distance coming again, um, the stories that didn't line up. Um, the incongruencies, and, and once again, he had a new passion now. He was off hunting, um, getting his guy's license in Alaska and hunting all over the state, Sh Chicago and North Dakota and Colorado and Alaska, and, and I was home again raising the children, asking him, why, why, why do you want to go? Don't you want to stay? You know, the kids have back-to-school nights, I, you know, dates, and 
I could really use some help here, and he, he just he just kept going. Um, and then there were more discoveries. Um, once he was, um, he didn't come home one night, and um, he said he had been going shooting in the middle of the night looking for those rats that come out in the rice fields in the middle of the night. So I got the kids up um, early. I said, we got to go look for dad. I threw him in the car and we went looking on the back roads for dad, um, thinking um, maybe he'd shot himself. I called in at work and everyone was concerned and praying. And then he walked in early in the morning when I had the, I was filing a missing persons report and he walked in and, and uh, the police officer walked out and, um, he, he, sorry, he told me some big long story um, of where he'd been and um, I knew in my spirit it wasn't right and I, I um, finally got him to confess that he'd been arrested for uh, soliciting prostitutes. And, and what did I do with that information? Uh, I prayed. I prayed. I, I asked God what to do. What should I do? I, uh, I don't know how to have boundaries. I mean, I don't have any choices. I um, mean, you know, I'm a Christian, and that's what Christians have to do. So I prayed. I got some more books. Um, I battled with Satan. I said, you're not going to get my marriage. You're not going to. You're not going to destroy the family because family is everything to me. Um, and so I would, um, we would talk. He would be like a blank wall. Um, and I would tell him, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go on date nights. We're going to have daily devotions. And he'd go, okay, yeah, I'm really sorry, and I'm, you know, I'm going to be truthful from here on out. And and then I remember the day um, when the notice for child support came in the mail, and uh, I argued with the lady at the county. He said, no, we don't have another child born on this day. And um, she um, she said she'd check it out, and I hung up, and it's like the light bulb went on. And I asked him, I said, do you, did you father a child in those early years? And he said, no, no. And, um, you know, for the first time, I had some anger rise up in me. And I said, well, you know what? I'm going to find out if this is truth. And if it is, you better tell me. And he confessed, yes, he had fathered a child. And that was the reason we had to sell our home and move um, way back in, when. And why we could never go back and have dinner in that town. Um, because he didn't want to run into someone. Uh, the discoveries kept trickling out year after year after year. There was... Um, so many tears, so much loneliness, so much hopelessness for me. And yet I would pound on God's chest and I'd say, you know, what am I going to do? Who can I tell this to? I can't tell anyone because I don't want them to um, think bad of my husband. And, you know, I'd read all the books, The Power of a Praying Wife. Oh, my gosh, I devoured everything I could get. And it said, you know, my sole purpose in life was to see that my husband was successful. This is my ministry. It's, it's my husband. And I'm giving it all I've got, God, but it's not working. And I felt so hopeless, so worthless, that I could not, um, I could not fix this marriage. And I, I, I was just despondent of what to do. So I did sink into depression a lot. Moodiness, hopelessness. With every discovery, there would be months and months, sometimes a year, of, of me... Um, just becoming a zombie, a walking shell, and he would, he would just wait for me to get over it, and um, and that's the life we lived, um, and it um, it continued on for quite some time. There were more, few more arrests, and um, I basically raised the children by myself, um, and then there was a period about four years ago where um, he had become so emotionally distant when the cell phone with the um, with the event of the cell phone um, and his ability to stay connected constantly on it he, it was like on the end of his hand um, he seemed to have lost interest in me didn't care to come to bed when I came to bed would leave for business trips at eight o'clock at night and uh, and it was just it was just getting to the as if it hadn't been hopeless before, it was really hopeless now. And one day he shared with me that he was going to come out of the closet and tell the children that he had a, a child. And he had been in contact with this child and, and her mother and had been meeting him for over a year and a half. And I hit the floor at that. Um, and it wasn't even the sexual betrayal at that point. It was the lies. 
I said, I, I can't believe after all I have forgiven you for, why would you still be lying to me about something like this? You know I know about your child. Why couldn't she come to me and say she wants to meet me, she wants me in her life? We, I said, I would do this together, but again, it's another lie, another secrecy. You're, you've gone off, and um, I, just, I just hit my wall, and I, I cried for days. I could not stop. Um, and I finally, for the first time, decided I needed help. I, I can't, me and God is not cutting it. I, I need somebody to talk to. So I went online and um, found a counselor, a local counselor. And I called her and I went in there and I started pouring out my heart. And, um, but yet, the strange thing was when I was telling her, the whole time I would back up when I was telling her all the horrific things that my husband had done, I would back up and say, but he's really a good guy. I don't want you to think that he's all bad because he does all these good things too. And I was trying to paint the full picture. And um, she just sat there with her mouth hanging open. Um, and she said to me, um, you have been a faithful wife for 35 years and you don't have to do it anymore. I was like dumbfounded. I said, yes, you don't, yeah, I do. You don't get it, I'm a Christian. I, I have to. God hates divorce. I don't have any choice. And she said, no, God hates a lot of things. He hates a hard heart. He hates lying lips. He hates feet that run to evil. He hates a lot of things, Fonda. And he hates what has happened to you. You do have choices. And I just sat there dumbfounded. It was like somebody had opened the cage door for the first time and, and let me free. I don't have to do it. I couldn't comprehend that. I don't want to make God angry. I mean, I'm a people pleaser, and I want more than anything to please God, and that had been my mission. Um, but evidently, I'm not doing a very good job at it, and, and she's telling me I don't have to do this anymore. Well, I couldn't even wrap my brain around that, so I took that information home, and I said, okay, well, if I don't have to be a faithful wife, that means I don't have to constantly try to attend to him for his every need. In fact, I'm, I'm going to stop that. He loves his shirts ironed and their collar stiff. I'm not doing that anymore. And that was all the um, boundary I could muster up at that time. Um, that's how I would quit being a faithful wife. I would just quit serving him uh, to that degree. Um, he was fine with that. And I would asked him to move out of the bedroom. He was fine with that. No problem. Um, and, um, you know, of course, the whole time telling me how much he loved me and um, he's, you know, he's sorry, you know, but we'll get through this. And uh, then the day came when my granddaughter found him setting up a rendezvous at our home when she was spending the night with a prostitute. And, and she was devastated. She looked up to her grandpa so much. She was 16 years old at the time and this just rocked her world. She didn't know who to tell or what to do. Um, and so she, um, she told her mom who confronted me and, um, gosh, my, my story's really out now. My daughter knows. She never knew. My granddaughter knows. And, and my daughter came to me and said, mom, dad needs to be off the property. I thought, well, how bad is that when your daughter has to teach you how to have boundaries? Um, so I, we, we had a, um, intervention. We met with him and, and told him, you know, that he'd been caught and, he was like, okay, I'll, I'll move away, but please, you know, can I still see the kids and hang out with them? And my daughter was so angry. She, she said, no, no, Dad. And um, so he moved out, and through the course of um, the next couple years, that was four years ago, he continued to pursue his addiction, um, only now he was free to do it without somebody breathing down his shoulder, and he just went full bore into it. Um, to the point he was caught, we, we worked together in a business and he was caught several times with pornography on the computer and he left his computer up one day um, with his email that he was meeting, uh, it was 10 o'clock in the morning and a couple of my kids worked with me and I said, where did dad go? And they said, well, I don't know. I said, he's going out to a gun shop and I looked at his computer and he'd set up a rendezvous with a prostitute and, and I finally got enough courage to say, that is it. I, I felt like I finally got the pass from God that said, it is done. And I went down and filed for divorce. Um, 
Mind you, all this time, he claimed he was in recovery. He was, uh, you know, a master at manipulation. He went to the 12-step groups. He had a counselor. He was making it look good on the outside, telling me how he'd do anything to have me back. Um, and um, But his actions and his words just weren't lining up. And I finally had to get out of the fantasy world that somehow I had control over... Um, healing this marriage. It was like you're trying to um, cure a cancer by sitting on the front porch rocking and singing a song or something. It, it just, I couldn't do it. I finally had to surrender it to God. And um, I, um, in the middle of this, I found the wonderful ministry of uh, Marsha Means. And, and um, that was my lifeline through the call-in groups and through her encouraging words. Uh, I never would have made it that first year. I was, um, I was on the closet floor, sobbing, um, desponding of life, begging God to take me. Um, th the pain was just horrific. I could not function. I lost 25 pounds. Uh, I couldn't go to work. Um, I was in... Um, so much pain to give up what I had fought for for 35 years. Uh, I was a loser. I felt like such a loser. I had let down my family. I had let down God. Um, and I, I was worthless. I felt so worthless um, that I, I despaired of um, life and um, also despised my own body that had betrayed me. I couldn't, um, I couldn't even look in myself in the mirror for the first year. Um, and he had always made comments to me about, well, if you'd like to have new breasts, I understand. I mean, everybody's doing it and I'll pay for them. Or, or you know, you broke your nose. Maybe you'd really like to get that fixed. I mean, um, so at that time I decided, um, yeah, yeah, he's out there looking at every beautiful thing. And this body is, you know, this body's yuck. No wonder he left me. No wonder he left me for all those other beautiful young things. So I, I will go get that nose fixed. And. So I, um, I did, I went in, um, and I was, I was, I was supposed to do it years earlier because I had broken and insurance would pay for it, but I was too afraid. Um, and my husband became angry at me because I, why wouldn't I do that? You know? Um, but now I wasn't afraid anymore. I, I didn't care. Actually, I, I wanted to hurt. I, I wanted, um, something on the outside of my body to hurt as much as the inside did. So I looked forward to the pain, and um, it was it was horrific. I um, I hemorrhaged and nearly um, died, and, and was a mess through it all. But it gave me a reason to lay in bed to be non-functional um, in a way that people could see. Because otherwise, you know, I felt like I was dying, and nobody could see it. But if if I got sick and I could lay there with bandages in bed then they would understand a, a little bit about what I was going through. Um, but that, you know, you can only um, convalesce for a couple months with that and you have to get back out in the world and pretend like you are, a, you know, a normal human being when nobody knows that somebody's cut your heart out. You're walking around a shell of a person and you no longer have a heart and you just become a zombie going through the motions. Um, but... Um, slowly but surely seeking out healing through counselors, through through meeting with Marsha and her groups and getting a sense of community and, and being heard for the first time in my life. Having people validate the pain I had gone through um, was tremendous. Like I said, I, I used to cry to God, am I going to die? Am I going to take these secrets to my grave? Um, be, because I, I, I couldn't tell anyone because it was it was shameful. It was our shame. It wasn't his shame. It was our shame. And um, and I had worked so hard on putting up this beautiful front. I mean, we had we had the you know the the perfect family, the big house, the Fourth of July parties where everyone came. We had a young couples group in our house. You know, my husband was a deacon for years. I taught Sunday school. I mean, we looked like we had it all together. And and. And I, and I lived in that fantasy. I lived in that fantasy because if I could pretend that it is what it looks like, then, then I would be okay. I would just bury the pain and keep going forward. Uh, and, uh, and then God and I would have the victory. Um, but 
I did not have control. I finally learned I do not have control over another human being. And I learned that, um, that by my forgiving my husband over and over and over again, I was actually driving him further and further into his addiction with no consequences. Um, in in Jane, Do Jane Dobson's book, Love Must Be Tough, he talks about that, that the loving spouse who enables the addicted husband um, it is actually, you know, driving the stake in the coffin. I did not know how to have boundaries. I did not know. And when I started through my recovery having boundaries, he resisted them like they were, he'd never seen such a thing. Um, and I'd never had them. I never got angry. I never, never had boundaries. I, there were never consequences. I took the consequences within myself. So I'm on a whole new journey to learn to um, that it is God's glory to protect ourselves. Um, that He has given us charge of this little girl inside, and um, we do Him a disservice when we let other people um, abuse us. Um, take advantage of us and emotionally destroy us. That wasn't his plan for his little girls. And so uh, I have, um, our divorce was final six months ago. And then in the, in, in the last um, five months now, he's come around again. Um, he was in a, a, an eight month affair probably with a woman that he was going to, um, buy a new house with, run off and live with, um, and, um, but, but now he's broken that off and he's coming back, he says, this time for sure. And um, the war within is, is horrific when you love someone and you hate them at the same time, when your, your heart cries for them to hold you, but you, your heart races when you're in the same room with them from anxiety. Um, I still experience that. When he's near me, my heart is racing. There's something in my body that says, this person's the enemy. Um, but there's that part of me that said, but he's part of me. Um, and so we're still on the journey. Um, we're still on the journey because he has decided to fully embrace recovery now for the first time. And, well, we would have been married 40 years this last summer. Um, and as a side note, his child was born on our anniversary. I, um, I, I think sometimes, God, do you have a sense of humor or what? Um, but um, I, I have agreed to, to do this journey with him for a year, to, to watch, to, to pray, to ask God what it is you want for me. But I know that during this process, it's for me to learn boundaries, for me to learn to take care of myself. For me to learn the word no, um, for me to not live in fantasy anymore, but to embrace reality, and um, and we are not um, we are not Tinkerbell. We can't wave a magic wand to make somebody okay, but we are responsible for ourselves. And so um, that's that's my mission now. Whether I will ever restore with him or not, only God knows. Um, and God is the God of miracles. Um, and, you know, I thought he had got to the bottom four years ago, um, but he had not. He, he thought he was, but he did not. He says he's there now and he's free. We did go do disclosure three, four months ago, and he did a lie detector test. And he, um, he told secrets that he had kept hidden for um, 40 years. And it felt wonderful and freeing for him. Uh, to live the addicted life would be horrible. Uh, to live as the, the spouse of an addict is a nightmare. Um, but God is good. He, is, he sustains us. If we keep our eyes on him, we keep hoping. We put one foot in front of the other day after day. And, and Marcia told me this early on, and I didn't know I would have. She said when I first started talking to her, Fonda, I do have joy again. There will always be the pain. Those scars will never go away. But she said, I have joy again. And oh, I couldn't imagine that. But I can still remember where I was standing on the stairs one day, catching myself laughing and going, wow, there it is. There it is. I have a smile again. It took a long time to get there. And now, you know, there are more good days than bad days. Um, so I just encourage everybody on their journey to um, 
to be hopeful that um, God has a plan for you, but it does require you to um, to stand up, to embrace boundaries, to to not turn a blind eye at sin. Um, it sin um, sin grows in the darkness. Um, we need to bring the light into it and say we we will not live with it. There are boundaries, and it is our duty to um, draw those around ourselves and protect ourselves. So, thank you for listening to my story. Mm -hmm. That was so beautiful.